Seven to eight <clears throat> goes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not uh, know God, or sorry, he who does not know love does not know God, for God is love. Thank you. You may not have heard, but we're talking about shepherds lately. And today, uh, since that's kind of on our minds, we wanted to address a topic that quite often gets missed, uh, and that's the relationship between shepherds and the flock. There, it, it has to be uh, kind of a two-way street for things to work as God intends. So we want to talk about that a little bit today, and each of us have a short topic, so we each won't be here very long. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I listened to myself. I did a little video uh, for work, and I had to do some commentary to it, and I listened back on it, and I listened to my voice, and I thought, those poor people <laughs> listen to me. So I'll be quick as I, as, as I can. Um, I, I fancy myself something of a little bit of a prophet, and... I'm going to tell you today that within an hour, some of you are going to experience this trauma I'm about to describe. I, I'm certain of it. All of us probably have experienced it, and those of you who have not don't know what you're missing. But in a little bit, someone's going to go out to the car, and they're going to turn to whoever they're with and say, where do you want to go eat? And the other one's going to say, well, I don't care. How about Kentucky Fried Chicken? Well, I'm not eating any fried foods right now. Well, then where do you want to go? It doesn't matter. It's truth, isn't it? Our family, on birthdays, we usually go out to dinner somewhere. We solve this problem and place this curse upon the birthday person. You have to choose where we're going to eat. It settles the decision. Now, that's, it's a humorous way to look at things, but I have to tell you, in my life, from time to time, I will get to a point where I have forgotten to let God make the decision. And when it finally dawns on me again that I should, I surrender and say, God, I need to let you take care of this. And it almost always immediately falls into place. Now that doesn't necessarily have to be a sinful versus non-sinful thing. Uh, we make decisions in our life that, that God allows us to make, but they're difficult. And we want to know what is the best. Sometimes where we live, which house we buy, the career we choose. Those things are difficult. And for the most part, God doesn't dictate those things to us. There are some things we know we should not do. But I want to point out the blessing of sometimes letting someone else just make the decision. And that is part of what we as the shepherds have as our responsibility. And I know that may not, may not immediately come to you as, as something you think, wow, that is a real blessing. But sometimes it is. And in the recognition of that, we want to talk about a verse that addresses that to some degree, and that's 1 Thessalonians 5.12. Paul says, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. Now, that's the New American Standard Version. It uses the word to appreciate. In the, in the NIV, it uses the word acknowledge. In the King James, it says know them. In the New King James, it says recognize, and in the uh, New English version, it says respect. What I found was is this, this in, uh, the, the Greek word doesn't have a really great single word translation from the Greek. I'm not sure I can really pronounce this word, but if, if you look at the combined definitions of the word recognize, it gives us a real good 
explanation of what Paul meant when he's talking about this. And there are kind of two definitions within it that the Greek really pulls together. One is to identify from knowledge of appearance or character. Now, the Greek word and what Paul's talking about is by far more their character. To identify or acknowledge or recognize or respect the, those who have charge over you by their character, by their fruits, what they do. The second part of that is to acknowledge the existence of, the validity, or legality of. So just to recognize the authority of something. The real literal translation would be to perceive. But that would be hard. It wouldn't make a whole lot of sense if you read that verse and it said perceive those that diligently labor among you and have charge over you. It doesn't quite make sense. But when we are thinking of the idea of perceive to become aware or conscious of something or to realize or actually the best way is to think of the word understand. It's, it's a perspective, to keep it in perspective, to look at uh, each of the shepherds on, on a basis of the whole man, who he is. To remember, he's not just the elder or shepherd or bishop or whatever term that you choose to look at from that, but he's also a husband and a father and a brother and an employer or an employee. And he may have a family who's struggling with illness and a car that's broken down and a house that needs plumbing fixed. It, we, we're the whole character of a mankind just as you are. We have our struggles, we have our difficulties, and we have this role that God has assigned us to make some of these decisions. And that's, I think, what Paul wants to really put across in this verse. And he does say, I want to read it again and, and let you think about these words now with that a little bit of that perspective. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. There's a man by the name of Heath Rogers who has written a great many books about spiritual matters. And I wanted to just give you a little quote of something that he wrote. And he said, uh, the idea behind being able to recognize the elders is more than just being able to pick them out from the rest of the congregation. We are to recognize or acknowledge them as the leaders of the congregation. We are to respect the authority God has given them as shepherds and superintendents of the local church. I take that very personally myself, not because I'm an elder, but I always have. I, I can remember from very long ago when an elder asked me to do something, I kind of took it with a double measure of consideration. There were things that an elder might ask me to do, and I would think, I, I don't think I'm really suited for that. And besides, I, I don't really want to do that. But I would do it anyway because an elder asked me to, and I found it to be a blessing. I, I, I still, being among the elders now, I still count their opinions kind of as double because of the wisdom, the scriptural knowledge, and just the spiritual nature of these men that surround me. So I want, I want to pass that along to you, not because I'm an elder, but because of what I see in these other men who are elders and these other men who we're considering to put in uh, as elders as well. Just something for you to consider and to keep in, in mind. And it's not because we want to have to uh, tell you what to do. It's a role that God has put upon us. And, and we do take that very seriously. And I'm sure the other uh, men, as they share another portion of this topic, will deal more with that. So I don't want to get into their portions. But I wanted to share those thoughts with you uh, uh, just to let you know that we're, we're aware that, that we have to be working with you, not instructing and lording over you of course as scripture warns against so thank you good morning and also I'm glad everybody's here this morning it's always good to see everybody you know it's amazing how much we miss everybody and especially hello to all those at home that are watching. We're looking forward to the time when you'll be back here with us also. You know, uh, for as long as I've been at Mesa, 
uh, there's been times that come up that we've decided to look for more elders. And uh, it's, we usually have put out to the congregation that we're looking for men. And for you to look around and to talk to people you're considering and ask them if they would be considered to run and that, uh, to, I mean to be an elder, take that position. And, uh, and then you guys present to the eldership a list of people who you believe fit that role, uh, that are above reproach, that fit the qualifications. And so as this goes on, as the elders come in and they're looking at that list, there's a bunch of, a group of men that have, you've put forth to us. So we look, you know, we, we have, sometimes we have a lot of different men on there. And so what we've done over the past years is we've taken the people that got put forth the, the most times and we start there and maybe we start with the top five. And if we don't find the one or the two that we're looking for, we keep going, you know, until we do. And, um, you know, we, people that were put forward, some of them, when we asked them if they would serve, they said no. They weren't, they weren't ready or they had too much going on or, you know, whatever, too many other responsibilities at the time. And so when you put men up to be elders, you are selecting them to be leaders here over the flock. And so they're, get, they're given a job that has a great responsibility. And because of that, they are due, like Chuck was talking about, a, a certain amount of respect um, if we go, if you want to turn with me to First Thessalonians five thirteen, First Thessalonians, we can start in verse twelve. It says, "We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work." Be at peace among yourselves. So we're supposed to put these people that we have chosen to put them up because of the job that they're to do. And, and, and it's a job that is uh, not always easy. Uh, as a shepherd, their job is to oversee the flock. And, and we're not only looking for physical problems that come up, but there are spiritual problems that come up. And it is not always easy. And so it's important for, for you uh, as Christians, all of us as Christians, to appreciate and lift up those to this higher esteem and let them know that we're behind them. Because uh, it, it is not an easy job. It's funny, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll get to that in a minute here. Uh, you know, the, er the elders are trying to make sure that the congregation is safe, that there's not uh, spiritual issues that are creating division or breaking the unity. There's a lot of different things that go on. And many times things are going on that you may not even know about, but it's come to our attention. We find out about it and we have to deal with it. And you never even knew it, it happened. And, uh, and so... These men, we, you put these men forward, and they, they agree to do, to do these jobs. And uh, to give you an example, you know, I'll use a recent example. Uh, because of this virus, you know, we had to decide, we decided to close, shut the church down for a short period. And then we were wanting to come back, and we had emails and conversations with people that wanted us to come back right away. Some thought we never should have closed. Some thought we didn't close fast enough. Some thought we still shouldn't open. So the truth is, whatever decision we made, there was going to be those that didn't agree with it. And so it's hard when you're trying to make a decision that protects everybody, but also keeps everybody in mind. It can be a very, a very stressful situation. And I can tell you that we met Probably just under that subject, uh, we met each time for at least two hours, sometimes three hours, and I bet you it was six, as many as six or seven times with all the elders, with the, minist with the ministers, trying to 
make a decision that was going to be wise for the church. And so it was not easy going to all that, spending all that time praying about it, trying to make a decision, knowing that no matter what we did, somebody was going to be complaining about it, you know, uh, whether it's about face masks, whatever it might be. I can personally tell you that I do not like wearing a face mask. I struggle with my breathing. One of my nostrils is like partially closed. I never breathe fully. I put this on and it is very difficult for me. But we chose this because we had a lot of people that were scared to come to church if everybody wasn't wearing a face mask. We had others that thought that face masks were worthless, that they didn't do anything. Believe me, I mean, even in the world, this same conversation is going on. But we chose a face mask because we wanted as many that felt that they could safely come to worship and be able to be here and worship together. We thought it was the wisest decision. And to this day, there are people that refuse to come to church because people, some people are not wearing masks. And so sometimes we think, well, it's my right, and it is, to make that decision, but your right also impacts other folks that you have to consider. And uh, so we chose the face mask. That's what it was. And we, knowing that most of us didn't want to wear them anyway. So believe me, it wasn't a light choice that we made. But the Lord wanted us to have people that we could put in charge, that we were willing to follow, that we were willing to listen to, even obey. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews 13, 17. And here in he Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, as those will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. You know, being an elder can be a very rewarding job, especially when you see a new babe in Christ clump out of the water, and I mean, what a joy. But it can also be very trying and traumatic. I've spent, we've spent evenings with couples that are considering divorce and we've been talking with them for two or three hours and they're basically angry with each other airing all this dirty laundry that you don't want to hear you don't want to know that about this person or that person these are friends these are people you love and we go this and and I've gone home and I can't say anything to Wendy about it because this stuff was said in confidence and I just sometimes want to cry I've had other times where we've had meetings, and this hasn't been recently, but we've had meetings that were so trying and traumatic that I just felt like I'd run a marathon and I was exhausted. I just go home and want to go to bed. And uh, it's very difficult. So being an elder, it, it can be very hard. And so that's why it's, it's very important for us as Christians to keep in mind that their job is difficult and we need your support. And believe me, I've got, I know that all of us have got received cards and phone calls of, of appreciation and we that that means so much, so much whenever people thank you. But uh, you know, there's also those other times when we make a decision on the masks and stuff and then people on Facebook or on social media will talk about, well, the preacher wasn't wearing a face mask or the song leader wasn't a fair a face mask. What you don't know is that we contacted the city of Mesa. We contacted the county of Mar Maricopa County. We contacted the state. Some of them, like the county, wouldn't give us any, any information. They wouldn't, didn't want to break it down and define it, so we would know. But basically, most of them said that if you're up, the, up here, away from everybody, and your job, your responsibility entails doing things like speaking and uh, singing. You were not required to wear the face mask. We didn't just make that decision without thinking. You know, we, we put a lot of time into that. I mean, you would not believe how much time we put into just these. I mean, it, it seems crazy, but then when you see how people react to it, it, it's really hard, you know, to know. 
And so, you know, what we, what, it can be very discouraging when you try so hard and then people are, you know, they just uh, say stuff that, and not have any idea how we did check on that stuff, you know, and, and we did do that. So all I'm trying to say is that when you submit, it does, it does mean yielding when you, to the elders. Sometimes the elders uh, will make a decision, and it'll be really easy for you to agree with them because it's the decision you would have made. But sometimes the decision is not one that you will agree to, and it is much harder. But I assure you, some of the times we have a lot more information than you may have to make that kind of decision. So please, uh, pray about that stuff, especially if it's some, sometimes we make a decision that uh, may not match up to your decision. I ask you to pray about it, because we, we prayed a lot before we ever came forward with a decision. So thank you very much. I know everybody says good morning, so I'll say it too. Good morning. Um, it's awesome. Um, I'm going to start with this. For all of you who know uh, or have kids or grandkids or are old enough, Ohana means family. Lilo and Stitch, nobody? Nobody? I mean, our grandson knows that. Uh, Ohana means family, and family means no one gets left behind. Um, so... Uh, in this portion, uh, I'm allowed to, to speak on um, communication and interaction between the, uh, the elders and the body and the body and the elders. Um, it is a two-way street, and um, there's two points that, uh, that I'd like to make. One is on informing the elders of, of the needs of the body, and uh, I'd like to present that as the latter point. So um, I want to first address a specific process of bringing accusations against elders. This is not something that we've struggled with at Mesa. Um, I'm just going to uh, say that we have great communication. Um, we have a body who um, knows the elders and elders. Uh, I hope you feel the same way that the elders know the body and that we're, um, we have an open door policy that we can talk, we can, um, we can argue, we can debate, but we're still family. I mean, that's what family does. But in this specific situation, um, Timothy is addressed by Paul, um, and this is specific, uh, about bringing an accusation against an elder. And uh, no one is above criticism. Um, everybody has struggles, uh, including elders. I know Chuck had mentioned that earlier. Um, there are differences between criticisms and opinions and actual accusations. And I might not be telling you anything you don't know that you can't read in the scriptures. Um, I know that uh, in Ashby's class, First Timothy, um, we've addressed this, but uh, so I don't need to really regale you with a lot of the information. But we do make, want to make a point that in First Timothy, we find the directions to Timothy on how to treat members of the body specific um, groups, um, which include a specific instruction concerning elders in the arena of accusations. So in 1 Timothy, if you'll turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17, starting in uh, verse 17, it says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worth uh, worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. So the concept is, is that, um, and as elders, uh, and as leaders, anybody who knows they've been in a leadership position, you make decisions, and, um, and there are always people who might not agree with you. They have a difference of opinion. They maybe don't like the decision, um, and sometimes that can be uh, very aggressive. And if you have issues, uh, the scriptures were clear on how to handle those by going to that brother. But sometimes we find, hey, I don't like this person so much. And it's real easy to start a witch hunt and to start to investigate and see, hey, what can I find on this person? And it can be the smallest thing. We see it in government all the time. We see it in, in a lot of aspects of life, maybe at your work. 
But in the church, God is very specific about how you are to handle those situations. And he says two or three witnesses. He's telling Timothy this because he says, Timothy, I'm charging you. You've got a job to do to, um, to install elders, to find these men. Um, but when they are in office, you might have people who are disagree. They don't like that person. They have fought with that person. They have maybe had uh, have problems in the past. And they are out to get that person. He says, this is the, the, what I want you to know is you do not entertain that unless it's serious. You have two or three people coming and telling you that. What can happen is you can, uh, without this in play, everybody can be a target. And when you're in leadership, that's hard to do a job when anybody at any time can bring an accusation and not be responsible for what they do. So this is to safeguard the leadership and therefore safeguard the church, the health of the church, so that we can continue and be about God's work. Um, you know, in chapter 3 earlier, verses 1 through 7, there are some real stringent qualifications that are put out for an elder. So when the body looks to men and says, we would like you as our elder, they, and they're installed, they have already passed the stringent test. And if you can read through that, um, it's some, some pretty high standards. So for you to bring an accusation against an elder, this is somebody that the body has already said, look, we know this person. We, we've seen their work. We, we ha they have a good reputation outside. Um, it's important to know that that person has already been qualified by the body. Now, here's the scenario. It is a process that's specific because if... If there is a problem, what if these accusations are true? Here's a method. This is part of that body communication. And what is the overall purpose? The purpose is to, hey, we want to be a body who serves God. If there is an elder who is struggling, if there's an elder who can have accusations presented that that is correct, these accusations are true, then the scriptures go on and follow. It says that uh, those elders who are saying you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning, I charge you in the sight of God, Christ Jesus, and the elect angels to keep the instructions well, without partiality and, do, and to do nothing out of favoritism. So God's concept is this, is I am the ultimate authority. Your opinion has to fall in line with my words. Everybody has opinions, but we have to follow God's word. This is specific, and it's very important for the health of the body. Um, I can stand here and say today that the elders are very thankful to the body here. We have not struggled with that problem. Um, we talk, we have issues, people bring uh, to sometimes their favorite elders concerns and uh, the next part of that is that I'd like to talk about is that communication between the body and the elders. There's a, a, a specific scripture um, that is an example of what I'd like to talk about, but um, I don't know if, if I, I hope nobody feels that this way that um, Jackie has to know every single name in the congregation, although he does, <laughs> because I hardly remember my name, especially when we come up here on prayer requests. If you see somebody walking down the aisle, like, oh, what is their name? Oh, no, it's my wife. <laughs> it's easy to forget. It's very easy to forget. Some of us don't have that recall, but, um, but the elders don't know everything. Um, the health of the body is that communication between the body and the elders of letting us know. Fortunately, we do a really good job. I mean, the staff here, um, we have emails, we have text messages, phone calls. Um, and um, I think it was um, Kevin who said, hey, we get letters from people. I mean, actual handwritten letters in the mail. We open them, it's kind of cool. And they're encouraging notes to us saying, thank you for what you do. And on the other hand, we also get messages saying, look, you know what, I heard this, and I'd like to talk about it, I don't agree. And that's perfect, because the elders are not on an island. This is family, this is the body. We have a role, but you have a role also. We all do, in, in our position. Um, so, it's really important, in James chapter 5, um, there's an exhortation to the family, and uh, he's addressing uh, specific groups. And he asked the body, he says, is anyone among you, in, in verse 14, sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they ought to pray over him, anointing him with oil. So the concept is that, look, are you sick? Then you call. Now, 
we're really good at that here. Some people are a lot better than others, but if you're not, it's important to know that if you have needs, to let us know. I mean, that's scriptural. Let us know. We don't, we, we don't know everything. Nobody has ESP. Um, so it's really important to understand that if, if we are to function properly and the relationship between the body and the elders is to remain fluid, um, we have to have that open communication. Uh, my experience is that in both areas, Mesa is fantastic. We have that communication. Um, and I think I can speak for, for the elders when I say that. Um, I would just like to say that uh, encourage us. You have in the past, you continue to do so, and um, let's remain to be that body who has that open communication and that we can sit down and talk about things and that we can share that common love that we sing about. Thank you. Well, I don't know this for a fact, but the other elders stole some of my uh, thunder this morning. <laughs> it's all because of the scriptures, and this is good. I want to talk to you about two things, and that's prayer and love. Prayer will be number one in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, I exhort you, first of all, with all supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving up thanks, be made to all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that they may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all goodness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. So... It is good that we have this and we have the congregation praying for us because our job becomes easier because we know prayers are going up and it makes it easier on the elders. So your shepherds at, at Mesa desires your prayers. We have an important and serious job to take care of. And because of it, your leaders spend times in prayer, diligently praying for the Mesa congregation. We have to. We need to know that members of our congregation are praying for us and our families. We solicit your prayers for us to have wisdom and discernment when dealing with problems that might arise. We ask that you pray for us to be holy as God is holy. We need prayers for knowledge and vision and strength to carry out our responsibility. We need prayers for unity and love. Need to know this. We love our church here at Mesa. We love the Mesa congregation. You have been very patient with us as we try to fulfill our ministry and to grow the Lord's church in this place. But we, your shepherds, are continuing need of prayers. And thank you for praying for us. We know many of you do. Now the next topic is love. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 and 13. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish them, uh, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. And so... The Bible says that elders are those who are, are working in the Lord's body. We need to highly esteem our shepherds in love. Love demands that we treat shepherds the way that we want it to be treated. Remember Jesus back in Matthew 7? He talks about that. And it goes the same for the elders. 
You may not recognize this, but your shepherd gets lonely. We need to know when we're doing something right, not just the time that we do something that you don't like. We need your encouragement. We need to encourage you. But we also need encouragement ourselves. We need you to place value on us as shepherds. The cards are encouragement of encouragement we receive are priceless. You need to know that. We need love shown to us. A pat on the back, a text message, or a short note, or a bowl of banana pudding. <laughs> Small things that let us know you care. These little acts of love fills us with great joy and helps us to continue the job God has given us. We all need to be praying for each other. It goes both ways, guys. And we need to show that love for each other. Back and forth, our love. Remember, in order for the shepherds to be effective in their work, the members likewise must fulfill their God-given responsibilities towards the shepherds. It's what God says, not us. Our responsibilities. We have responsibilities to the flock. Acts chapter 20 and verse 23. Paul said to feed the flock which your overseers. So you got to know that it goes both ways. We have to feed you. You have to encourage us. You have to esteem us. And you have to try to obey the things that we've set. That as long as they're not unscriptural. You need to obey those things. And so today, your shepherds, you need to know, love each and every one of you. We pray for you every, I pray for you guys every night. And we need to learn to pray and to love each other. Let me say this. I'm, I'm the oldest elder as far as been here, an elder the longest. This group of men we have right now as elders are just superior. They are great men. And I'm sure the other two will join us. We'll be the same way. We have to have great men that wants to lead a great church and to be a part of it. And so let me encourage you as Kevin, I think, read earlier, that by doing so, you make our job easier. And that's what we want. We love you. We pray for you. And the Lord bless each and every one of you. Thank you for watching our video. We have a lot more content here on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to get the latest notifications when we have new material come out, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.